Oh, hello again. So in this particular lecture, I want to talk about mainly the axial uh, skeletal system or the axial skeleton. But I do want to talk and introduce a little bit more about the bones and how to name the bones and uh, kind of what you expect to know um, from learning the bones. So bones can be classified in, uh, in many different kinds of ways. Uh, they can be classified based on their shape and size. So we do have bones that are considered to be flat bones in the human body. And these particular bones are going to be uh, flattened. They can be a little bit curved. Uh, and they include bones such as your sternum, the scapulae, the, which will be your shoulder blades, ribs, and most of the bones of the skull. Bones can also be uh, classified based on being long, so they're longer than wide. So the shaft plus the two ends are often expanded. Um, these serve as basically levers so that your muscles can pull and, and produce major body movements. Uh, all limb bones except for the patella, which is your kneecap, um, the bones of the wrist and ankle are going to be considered long bones. Short bones are going to be equal in length and width and or cube shaped and they provide the limited gliding movement. These will be the bones uh, that would make up your wrist and ankle. So if you looked at these particular bones making up your wrists and your ankle, they may actually have uh, more, uh, they were short bones, kind of only, almost cube shaped. Um, we do have some kinds of bones called sesamoid bones and uh, these would uh, basically be bones that uh, that form in tendon and uh, and then we have irregular bones which would be um, bones that don't fit in any category that we've described before they're just kind of irregular shaped and these would be something like your vertebrae and hip bones so here you can see a vertebrae which would be an irregular bone here's the humerus a long bone we have the sternum here representing a flat bone and then we have here the talus which is one of your bones uh, making up your um, your ankle that would be considered a short bone. There are also bones that are called sutural bones. Uh, not everybody has sutural bones, but if you do, they would be located uh, in your skull. And uh, you can see that there are extra little bones here. These are sutural bones. And these structures here that everybody has in their skull are called sutures. These are places where uh, bones come together and almost like puzzle pieces come together and fit uh, to form uh, the, the complete cranium. So each bone that you are going to learn uh, is going to have different parts on it that are named. And they do name uh, parts commonly. Um, so what I want to do is go over sur surface uh, bone surface markings with you and kind of describe what these these parts mean so that when you learn for example superior orbital fissure um, you'll know what a fissure is okay so superior is uh, indicating you know that it's higher orbital is around the orbit of the eye and then the fissure it means a narrow slit between the bones so you can see this little narrow slit right here. That's the superior order orbital fissure. This is the inferior orbital fissure down here. And these little slits are, are where um, blood vessels or nerves pass from the, uh, from the brain or the, behind the skull to the front of the face. Like in this particular, particular example, it may be going towards the eyes or to the facial um, tissues. So that's what a fissure uh, means. A foramen is a hole for the passage of blood vessels, nerves, um, or ligaments um, that, that can pass through the bones. Um, if you think about it, the skull is a structure that's a complete structure that wraps around your brain. Well, how do blood vessels get in? How do nerves get out? How do veins get out? How do arteries get in? And they're going to go through these uh, fissures or they'll go through these foramen. And uh, so the magnum foramen is, uh, is a large hole in your occipital bone, and it is uh, there for the passage of the spinal cord to come out of the, um, out of the skull. So if it's a little itty-bitty hole, it could be a foramina, and we'll see foramina in, um, in different bones that we'll see today. A fossa is a shallow depression, so your mandible, your lower jaw, fits into, um, into your temporal bone via the mandibular fossa. That's a little depression there that the part of your mandible sits into and connects into. Um, <coughs> a meatus is a tube-like opening 
So the external auditory meatus is a tube-like opening to the inner ear <coughs> where your, spine, where your um, eardrum is. So that's what a meatus is. A condyle is a rounded projection with a smooth articular surface. So you can see the con, uh, uh, condylar process here. And uh, this would fit into that uh, mandibular fossa that we just saw um, just a second ago. So when it has a rounded process, that means it's articulating, and the roundedness you know, reduces the friction from contact of two bones together. So an epicondyle is a roughened surfaced uh, projection on a condyle. So if we see here is uh, uh, the femur, so this is the femur right here. This is a smooth surface, a condyle, and above that smooth surface is a rough projection called an epicondyle. Now you can have a lateral epicondyle if it's away from the midline of the body, or a medial epicondyle if it's toward the midline of the body. Okay, so we're using now directional terms in addition to surface marking terms to uh, indicate where, uh, where something's located. Usually if something's roughened, that means something's going to attach to it like uh, uh, ligaments or uh, tendons. A line is a narrow, um, is a long narrow ridge or border and it's a little bit uh, less prominent than a crest. A crest will be similar to a line but just larger and more prominent. So here we can see in the, um, in the ox uh, occipital bone back here in the back of the skull, we have the superior nuchal line. So it's a little line that goes this way. And then we have the inferior nuchal line, little line that goes this way. Again, any kind, of, anytime you have a raised surface or a line or a crest, it's going to be a place where ligaments or um, tendons or muscles attach to. So a facet is a smooth, flat, um, slightly concave articular surface. So a facet. Here you can see the facet a facet here and here on a vertebrae and this will be where vertebrae will uh, articulate with other vertebrae. So a head is usually a rounded articular process supported by a neck. So here we have a head of the rib and then we have the neck of the rib. We also see, we'll see head and neck in the, uh, some of the long bones of the body as well. Well, a prominent ridge uh, or elongated process will be a crest. So this is the crest here, the medial sacral crest on the sacrum uh, of, the, um, of the body. A spineous process is a sharp slender projection. So if you take your finger and run it down the surface, uh, the middle, medial surface of your back, um, you will find that you will run your finger across the spineous process of the vertebrae. So that's what the spineous process actually is. A trochanter is a very large projection. It's only found on the femur. And uh, you have one of these trochanters here called the greater trochanter. So this is the greater trochanter right here. And this is the lesser trochanter right here. And these are only going to be found on the femur, which is your upper leg bone. A tubercle is a, vari uh, a variably sized rounded projection. So here we have the articular tubu tubule right here on the temporal bone. A tuberosity is going to be a variably sized projection with rough bumpy surface. So this is the sacral tuberosity. Again, this would be places where you would find you know, um, ligaments or tendons attaching to. Okay, and those are some of the parts that we'll be, we'll be going over. Um, and for each bone, you will have to learn the bone name, and then you'll have to learn some of the bone parts uh, as well. So as I indicated in probably the last uh, lecture, um, we do have an axial skeleton. These are bones that protect the organs of the head, neck, and trunk. And they will include the bones such as the skull, the hyoid bone, which is a bone that's right underneath of your mandible, and your tongue muscles attached to it. Uh, we also have the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. So these are part of the midline of the body, the axial part of the body. Um, hanging off the body, a pen means to hang off of, is the appendicular skeleton. And these are bones of the upper and lower limbs and bones that anchor them to the axial skeleton. So we're looking at the pectoral girdle the upper limbs, pelvic girdle, and lower limbs. The pectoral girdle would be um, uh, things such as your clavicle. Um, it will, uh, and then your upper limbs, you're familiar with 
pelvic girdle would be your pelvic bones and lower limbs you're familiar with. Okay, so we just kind of look here. Here we have the, an axial skeletal picture. You can see it's kind of in the midline or center of the body. And, uh, and it's got a really strong protective role of, of internal organs, uh, you know, the brain, sense organs. And uh, so, again, it makes up the midline of your body. Anything that hangs off or supports the things that hang off, such as your clavicle, scapula, of course, your upper arms, your... Um, your uh, pelvic girdle, which would be your pelvic bones, and your lower limbs, those are all called, um, are part of the appendicular skeleton. We'll visit that in a different or separate lecture. So what we want to focus on in this lecture is the axial skeleton. Um, you know, it is kind of hard to lecture about bones, to be honest with you. Um, bones are something that you need to pick up the bones in lab and, and study and spend time feeling them and looking at them. Uh, but what, what I want to do, and in, in the reason I'm doing this particular lecture, is to go over some of the parts that you'll be responsible for knowing and um, basically just saying the names. Um, you know, these names, are, you know, all of this is in Latin and and, and using Latin and Greek root, <coughs> root words, and, uh, and, and sometimes they're difficult to, to, to even say. So I'm just trying to give you some familiarity with you know, where these parts are located, maybe some little fact about them, and then you know how to pronounce their, um, their names. So appendicular we'll do in another lecture, but we want to focus on the axial in this one. There are 80 uh, bones in the axial skeleton. That's 80 out of the 206 that you'll be responsible for knowing. And uh, your skull has uh, your uh, your skull and associated bones of the skull have about 29 um, bones. So your cranium uh, has eight bones. Your face has about 14 bones. You have uh, six um, inner ear bones that help you to um, to uh, send messages about airborne sounds to your brain. And then there's one hyoid that's tucked underneath the um, the mandible there. The thoracic cage has around 25 bones. Um, you have one sternum. It does have three parts. We'll go over in a little bit. And then 24 uh, individual ribs. So the vertebral column has 26 bones. You have uh, 24 vertebrae, one sacrum, and one coccyx or, or tailbone. So we'll go through and talk about uh, each of these different parts. So like I said before, your cranium has eight bones. And it's going to have one occipital bone which is back here in the back. We have two parietal bones. You have one on each side. You have one frontal bone there in the front of your skull. Uh, you have two temporal bones, one on each side. Uh, one sphenoid, which is right here. This one's kind of hard to see in this particular, um, this particular view, but we'll see it in, a, in many different views in just a second. And you have one ethmoid bone. Collectively, these make up your cranium or kind of like the vault of the skull. And um, these are very, very tough and protective of your brain. So your face is made of 14 bones. Uh, you have two maxillae. Um, these would be f uh, your, your upper face bones uh, ab above your teeth. Your, your upper teeth actually sit inside the, uh, the uh, maxillae. Um, and you do have a right and left uh, maxilla. Uh, you have two palatine bones, which is not visible in, in the graphic below. Uh, two nasal bones, which are little small bones at the base of your, of your nose. Uh, you do have two inferior nasal uh, uh, con uh, conchi. And uh, we'll see those in a different view. Uh, you have two zyg zygomatic bones. These kind of make up part of your cheek. Um, we have two lacrimal bones, which uh, have a little uh, tube that goes through it that uh, your tear ducts run through. Uh, we have one uh, vomer, and you, you can barely see it in this particular view here, but we'll see it in a better view. And then one mandible. The associated bones of your of your uh, of your uh, skull uh, will be. Um, the hyoid. The hyoid is a little bone that sits low below your mandible, and uh, it uh, again is an attachment point for muscles uh, such as the tongue muscles. And uh, we do have uh, uh, six um, auditory ossicles, which are little ear bones that allow us to um, to sense hearing. So, um, so this, these are the stapes, the incus, and the malleus. All right. Now again, tough thing to lecture on, but uh, I'm doing this out of um, out of just trying to get you to see how to pronounce the names and just to hear those names. Um, 
it's a hard section to read in a textbook. It's not a very, uh, I guess, flowing section uh, to read. But I do encourage you to try to do the best you can to keep up with your reading and learn as much as you can about these bones. For some of you, this is your business. If you're going into physical therapy, um, you know these will be things that you'll have to definitely know. Um, you know, if you're going into dentistry, you know, the skull definitely are, are the bones that you would want to uh, be very familiar with. So we'll just start at the top and kind of work our way down. And uh, I'll show you different views of the of the skull. Um, so your parietal bones, you have two of them, one on each side. And uh, they are connected together by what we call the sagittal suture. You have the frontal bone, so it's this main bone here in the front. And uh, very protective of the front of the brain. There is a suture here uh, called the coronal suture that connects your um, your parietal bones with your frontal bone, and uh, and so th there are places where bones come together in the skull, and those are called sutures. Here you have a little uh, scale-like uh, bone here that's kind of um, kind of hidden there, but it's uh, a very small bone um, called the lacrimal bone, and uh, it has a lacrimal duct that goes through it, which is a tear duct. So the ethmoid bone is. Uh, you can see a little small section of it here. Change the color of my pen. So you can see a little small section of it here. Let's see if I can change the color of my pen. You can see a little small section of it here and here. And then there's a little small section of it here as well. It's a very complex bone, and we'll get a chance to look at that um, when we, um, when we uh, do lab. So you have your squamosal suture, which is uh, you'll see in a better dimension. In just a second and you can see a little piece of the sphenoid bone here the sphenoid bone you can see a little piece of it here on the side or lateral side and a little piece of it here in the orbit of the eye so your temporal bone is located on the side we'll see it in a better view in just a second uh, and uh, this is called the uh, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone this is uh, making up what you would call I guess your nasal septum part of your nasal septum so um, there are parts that you have to know on bones. So the infraorbital foramen, infra uh, means below, orbital means the orbit. So there's a little hole right there in this maxilla that's called the infraorbital foramen. Again, any foramen is going to be a passageway for nerves and for blood vessels. Uh, we can see in this uh, picture here the vomer. So the vomer is this little bone right here. Um, and uh, if you take your finger and push backwards, uh, you know, you can't push backwards because it hits the vomer bone. The mandible is your, is your lower jaw. And on the mandible, there is a hole that goes through called the mental foramen. So there is a divider, divider right here. And so this would be, uh, these are each uh, separate maxilla. Um, you do have also a little scroll-like uh, scroll bones in your uh, inside of your uh, nasal cavity. The, one of them, the inferior nasal um, um, concha, is right there. And uh, you also have uh, middle nasal and uh, superior nasal concha as well. Conchae being plural. So zygomatic bone is making up part of your cheek right here. So it's this little green bone. And uh, we have the sphenoid bone again that you can see a part of. Nasal bones are easy to see in this diagram. You have two of those. And then there is a foramen above called the superorbital foramen. Sometimes in some folks it's a notch. It's a superorbital notch. Uh, or you might have a, a foramen. I guess you would have to see through x-rays what you have. So this is a side view, uh, and again, it gives you an opportunity to see some, some little different bones. But we have, again, the parietal bones. We have that squamosal suture, which is going to connect the temporal bones and the parietal bones, and the temporal bones and the sphenoid bone. We have the, ox the, the occipital bone, the sphenoid bone. We have over here the frontal bone, nasal bone, the maxilla. Then we have the zygomatic bone, the mandible temporal bone. Um, on the temporal bone, there are a few parts that you need to know. Um, you need to know the external auditory meatus, which is this hole it goes through. Um, the mastoid process is this rounded process down here. Um, we also have on the temporal bone the styloid process, which is a little sharp process that comes out. Again, these little processes are connecting points or they are places where muscles uh, or tendons really uh, connect to. Um, 
So we do have here the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. It's a little ridge that goes over and connects with the zygomatic bone. And this would be the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Um, I think that's all that I can see right here. You can see the lambdoidal or the lambdoid suture uh, right here connecting the occipital and the, and the parietal bones. So from a broad bottom view, you can see some different things. Uh, you can see here the palatine bones, which we couldn't see before. You have a pair of those here and here. Um, you can take your tongue, and if you feel the very back of the top of the roof of your mouth, you're feeling the palatine bone. Um, if you take your tongue and feel the front of the roof, it's called the palatine process of the maxilla. You have here your incisive fossa, which are little places where blood vessels and nerves go through. And we can see the zygomatic bone. Um, here you can see the sphenoid bone. It almost looks like to many people a bat or a butterfly. It's a very complex shape bone. Um, so it's this purple bone here. I just kind of outlined it. And uh, that's called your sphenoid bone. There is an arch right there called the zygomatic arch. And uh, it makes up part of your cheek. Uh, here we can see the vomer bone pretty good. But it's a complex arrangement that goes all the way to your nasal cavity. Uh, here we can see the mandibular fossa. Again, seeing a flat picture of it's hard, and lab time is where you're going to really need to know those things and, and study those things. And we can see a, um, a flat picture of the, um, the styloid process. And a little piece of the external auditory meatus. Mastoid process of the temporal bone is right there. Uh, we can see the uh, smooth surface here, this uh, occipital condyle, um, and that's going to be an articulation point with the first vertebrae. And, of course, temporal bone here. Um, this large hole is the foramen magnum that you can see right here. And this is where, let me go back, sorry about that. So you can see the foramen magnum is right here, and that's where your spinal cord comes out of. And then we have the occipital bone right here. So if you take and you cut the um, top of the skull off, uh, in, a, in a transverse uh, cut, you can get down and see inside of the skull. And inside the skull, you can see uh, parts of the ethmoid bone. So this would be the ethmoid bone here. And there's a little crest there called the cristagalli. And then there's little, uh, a little place where there's little holes through the ethmoid bone, and that's called the cribriform plate. So the uh, cribriform plate are where um, neurons will dangle down into your nasal cavity, and that's how you have the ability to sense smell. Uh, you can see this is the frontal bone. Here you can see a piece of the sphenoid bone. Inside the sphenoid bone, there is a little depression there called the cella tersica, and that's where your pituitary gland sits. So we have here the temporal bone, parietal bone, and uh, foramen magnum once again, and occipital bone. So this is a mid-sagittal cut through the, um, through the skull, and again, gives you different uh, views of, of these things. Um, so some of the bones we talked about, frontal and uh, parietal. Uh, we have the temporal bone, occipital bone. I can see the sphenoid here. Um, this is a, a nice little view of the ethmoid bone, showing you the nasal septum that it's creating. And here's the vomer. This is really nice. You can see it all the way from the, from the back of the throat to the front of the nasal cavity. Um, you can see sinuses here, these are little uh, hollow spaces inside of bones. Um, that's your frontal sinus, your sphenoid sinus there. And uh, I can see the palatine bone and, uh, and, of course, the mandible and maxilla. So just some different views of different parts there. Um, you know, throughout the, uh, the, the, uh, the skull bones, we do have um, paranasal sinuses. These are, uh, are basically hollow spaces inside of bones that are continuous with your nasal cavity and the mucous membranes of your nasal cavity. So these, you know, starting in your nose, going all the way into these sinuses, there's a continuous mucous membrane that, um, that goes through the frontal bone, the, uh, the maxillary bones, the sphenoid bone, and the uh, ethmoid bones. And um, these hollow spaces are used for resonating chambers so we can make interesting sounds with our voice. Uh, and they also increase the surface area of the nasal mucosa. And uh, the reason nasal mucosa are, are important is that all the air that comes into your, into your lungs, um, unless you're breathing through your mouth, goes through the nasal 
these uh, these nasal passages and through these sinus passages, and uh, these 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 uh, paranasal sinuses and nasal cavity will moisten the air, warm the air, and they're full of uh, of uh, mucus, so they trap airborne particles and make your air clean that you're breathing. So the paranasal sinuses increase the surface area of of um, you know, for you have, having the ability to warm your air, moisten it, and then clean it before it goes down to the lungs. Um, these sinuses are found in the frontal bone. I'm sure you've had a frontal nasal sinus headache before. Um, they're found in the ethmoid bone, so you can see them down here in the ethmoid bone. They're found in the maxillary bone, and uh, and even in deep in the in the sphenoid bone. Okay, again, they're all continuous with each other, so sometimes if you get an infection in one, it may go to the other sinuses, it may not, um, but when you get these blocked sinuses, the cells inside the sinuses that are making up the mucous membrane will suck air out of those sinuses and create a negative pressure and create the pressure that you feel as a headache. Sometimes you feel like your teeth are falling out when you have one of these sinus headaches, and that's just because of the pain of the sinus above it. This is just showing you a different diagram of the of the various sinuses. Here you can see the sphenoidal sinuses in the sphenoid bone, frontal sinuses in the frontal bone, um, and uh, and uh, so that's just a couple of good pictures of those particular sinuses. Just a different view of the sinuses. All right. So before we go into any further uh, bones, um, it's kind of interesting that a baby's bones aren't fully um, fully formed and fused so you can see that there are fontanelles which are which are fibrous um, you know tissues that allow the bones to be more flexible so all of these tissues are fibrous membrane tissue uh, it's a it's a connective tissue and uh, it allows the bones to be flexible so that when the baby goes through the birth canal the bones can be flexed and then can fit through the birth canal so you can see from the top view these fontanelles, and uh, and uh, just again they're not a fully few. You know it allows the bones not to be fully fused so that they can be flexible and and fit through the skull. Now because they're flexible, a baby's head will come out looking really kind of strange sometime. Uh, my second child um, that we had came out looking like a shark, so his head looked like a shark fin. I'm serious, and the and the doctor pushed um, the bones back into place so that they actually look rounded. Okay, now what I'm going to do is show you actual bones and just kind of fly through this a little bit. Uh, we do have in lab a disarticulated um, uh, skull, so you can take each bone and look at it. Um, and we also have whole skulls that you can take a look at and learn. Um, not every single part you're going to have to know on here. So I'll circle parts that uh, may be of, of, of high interest and are possible um, parts that you would be familiar with or have to be familiar with for our bone practical. So as you as you look at this uh, lecture and you've printed out the notes, I would take a highlighter and highlight the parts that you would be responsible for knowing. So of course you need to know that this is the occipital bone, but a couple of parts you would be, you know, have, would be responsible for knowing would be the external um, occipital protuberance. It's a little knot on the back of your head. You can take your hand and feel it. Uh, frame and magnum is another part that you would have to uh, know, and the occipital condyle, which is this little rounded surface that articulates with your first vertebrae, those would be parts that you would need to know. Uh, these nuchal lines are interesting, but uh, you know I have to minimize how much you have to know, and uh, but there are places where muscles would attach to or tendons uh, would connect to those bones via those particular lines there. And you could feel those lines if you take, take and touch the back of your head. So showing you now the parietal bone. This is just the parietal bone, and no parts uh, really are necessary to know on that. Uh, you would be, you know, familiar with the with the suture there. That's a squamosal suture or squamous suture, and then we have the coronal suture, and then the lambdoid suture back over here. So this is the frontal bone. Um, you would be uh, needing. You would need to know the. Uh, the uh, superorbital foramen or superorbital notch, depending upon if you have a hole or a notch there, those would be parts you would need to know for that. Um, so this is uh, showing you kind of a back view of the frontal bone, and uh, for this one, um, 
excuse me, this is a this is a orbital view of the of the um, of the frontal bone. So you can see uh, the orbit there, and uh, um, these are the sinuses that are inside of the frontal bone. But uh, the supraorbital um, notch or foramen would be the one that you would need to uh, know. So here we see a view of the temporal bone. This is kind of an inside view. Um, there is only one part here, actually two parts, the styloid process and mastoid process, but there are better parts for you, or better views for you to see this uh, particular bone in. So this is kind of a better view to see the temporal bone. The external auditory meatus would be a part you would be responsible for knowing, the mastoid process, the styloid process, um, so, and, and uh, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone would be another one that you would be familiar with. Um, mandibular fossa is also a very common part uh, where your mandible articulates with your um, with your temporal bone. Um, this is where airborne sound comes in. Um, this is where your inner ear bones are located inside here. So this is where your perception of hearing, well, well where your reception of hearing will occur inside of that bone if I were to break it open for you to actually see. So inside of the mastoid process, there are little, uh, you know, chambers, little airborne chambers. And sometimes when you get an inner ear infection, um, you can actually, it, it can cause uh, uh, mastoiditis um, and, uh, and uh, a swelling of the, these little air chambers in there. So that can be very painful and irritating for people. Um, this is the sphenoid bone. You can see it looks kind of like a bat or a butterfly. I guess more like a bat to me in this dimension. Uh, it's a very complex bone. You can see it articulates with numerous places within the um, within the uh, the skull. Uh, it's kind of like the seat of the skull. Your brain would be sitting on top of it. And uh, if I were to pick a part uh, for you to know, the cella turcica is where your um, pituitary gland sits. Uh, so that's a very important part. Now the foramen uh, oval and foramen spinosum, um, these are just holes that uh, are going to allow nerves to pass through. They're important. I'm not going to require you to know them. They're important though because some of your cranial nerves pass through them. And the optic canal is uh, another important part because um, your optic nerve will pass through that. This is just showing you a frontal view. If you look over here in the skull, the purple... Um, the purple bone there showing you how it makes up the back wall of your orbit. Uh, again, uh, there's only a couple parts here. The superior orbital fissure would be interesting for you to know. Um, so that's where uh, are, uh, many things are going to pass through. Um, and anywhere you see, uh, you know, a foramen, it's where a hole. I'm not going to require you to know that one, but uh, it's a hole for the passage of nerves and blood vessels. So this is a very complex bone. This is your ethmoid bone, and uh, only a couple parts you would need to know would be cribriform plate and crystagalli. This is a bone you'll have to get in hand and look at because it's so complex looking at it here from this particular view. Just a posterior view of the ethmoid bone showing you the crystagalli. It's a little crest. Um, here you can see the middle nasal uh, uh, concha. Uh, concha, excuse me, and uh, and uh, that's going to be you know lined with mucous membrane, making up part of your nasal cavity. The perpendicular plate makes up your nasal sept. Again, it, it's hard to lecture on this. You really need this in your hand, three dimensionally, to really see and get a good understanding of this. Um, this is your right maxilla, and you do have a left maxilla as well. Uh, you can see, uh, let's see if there's any parts you need to know. Uh, there's the infraorbital foramen, but there's a better view of it that you can see. It's a little hole right here. Um, and uh, your teeth uh, uh, fit into your, uh, your um, uh, maxillary bones um, and, uh, and fit into these little, um, these little sockets right here. Uh, but that's not something you need to know the name of right now. So this is just a view showing you the, the back of the top of or roof of your mouth showing you the palatine bones. So a frontal view of a real skull and uh, you can see your nasal bones here. So that's a nice little port part right there. You can see the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone making up your nasal septum in there. 
uh, I can see uh, also the uh, the division of the left and right maxillary bones, infraorbital foramen, supraorbital foramen uh, is a nice little view of that right there. Um, and uh, so that's some of the major things you can see in this particular um, view. I can see a little bit of the mastoid process of the temporal bone there. Uh, I can see an inferior nasal uh, concha right there. Middle, and that's a bone. That's a pair of bones. Middle nasal concha would be part of the ethmoid bone. Uh, I can see a little piece of the lacrimal bone right there. So that's kind of nice there. And uh, I can see the superior orbital fissure, which is part of that sphenoid bone. Again, there's thousands of pictures that you can look at, uh, but um, this is just showing you uh, what makes up the orbit of the bone. So um, I can see this superior, uh, super orbital notch right there, a little piece of the sphenoid bone, a um, little piece of the ethmoid bone, lacrimal bone. Uh, let's see what else I can see. Part of the maxilla, part of the, uh, the uh, zygomatic bone. Your orbit's made of lots of different bones. Again, it's probably an overkill, but just showing you um, the orbit once again. So here's a view of your lower jaw, your mandible. Mental foramen would be a part that you would want to know of the of the um, mental of the um, the uh, mandible. Of course, your teeth sit in your mandible, and there are articulating parts. Um, so there are articulating parts that articulate with the temporal bone. Again, yeah, just showing you the mandible. This is from a, a medial inside view. And the mandibular foramen is kind of interesting, especially if you're going into, into dentistry or uh, dental hy hygiene. Um, this is typically a nerve. Uh, a nerve goes through here that uh, your doctor, when they stick that long, long needle in and inject anesthesia in, this is what they're trying. They're trying to get this nerve right here and inject an anesthesia into it, thus numbing your all the nerves going to your um, to your jaw. This is that hyoid bone I was talking about before, so connecting point for some of your tongue muscles and, and other structures in your throat. And uh, it's a small bone, but it's a very critical bone. Um, okay, so, so we've talked about the skull and uh, the facial bones. Um, this is the sternum. The sternum uh, is made of three parts, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. We also have here yeah, 24 ribs. Um, so you have uh, 12 ribs on each side. And, uh, and then you can see the vertebrae here. We have different kinds of vertebrae. We have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and then five lumbar vertebrae. And then there's five fused vertebrae that form your sacrum. And then we have the tailbone or the coccyx bone below. So as I said before, you have seven cervical vertebrae. These make up what we should call your neck. And uh, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, and these would be making up your thoracic region right here. And then five lumbar vertebrae, which make up your lower back. And then you have your sacrum and your, uh, and your coccyx or tailbone. Um, so there are curves there. You can see the cervical curve, the thoracic curve, the lumbar curve, and the sacral curve. Sometimes these curves will be... Will be um, 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 not shaped the correct way, and there are uh, certain kinds of conditions that are caused because of a misshapen curve. Um, your vertebrae do differ. Uh, they, they differ based on if they're um, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. So your neck vertebrae have a extra, some extra little parts. But generally speaking, they do have some, some similar parts. This would be kind of like a, a generic um, vertebrae. Um, you do have the, ver the vertebral body, so that's the body of the vertebrae. This would be like uh, towards the front. The spiniest process back here would be what you feel when you run your back, when your fingers down your backbone. So this would be the back. This is the back here, the posterior. This is the anterior. Um, there are, you know, there is an, uh, an arch that's uh, formed inside of here. So we have laminae, which make are the bony ports, parts that make up part of the arch. Uh, the pedicel here is this little connecting stalk between the arch and the body. And uh, there are processes, articular processes, where you can connect to 
um, the ribs into the other vertebrae. This is just a lateral view of the vertebrae showing you the vertebral body, which is the main part of the vertebrae. Here's the pedicel. Here's a transverse process. The transverse process comes off to the side, uh, as you can see right there. And let's see if there's anything else. So we do have facets for the articulation of, of, of ribs. And, um, and uh, that's about what you can see here. There is a vertebral foramen um, where your spinal cord fits through. So that's found in all of your vertebrae. Again, you can see the body there. And uh, we have a spinous process, which you run your finger down your back. You can feel that. And then the transverse process comes off to the side. This is just showing them articulating together. You can see the superior articular process, the superior articular facets. Um, the facets are what are going to connect the, um, the ribs together. Um, the spinous process, again, you run your finger down the back, and that's what you feel. Vertebral disc is that fibrocartilage that pads each of the bodies from rubbing up against uh, one another. This is just a side view. It's a nice view of the, uh, of the um, intervertebral discs. This is a cut view right here showing you inside. Uh, and then this is a non-cut view down here showing you the bodies that are buffeted from touching each other by the intervertebral disc. Spinous process comes off the back. Transverse process is actually coming towards you. So these are your, uh, your cervical vertebrae. So we have C1, they're numbered C1 to C7. So these would be the most superior, the most inferior. And uh, if you break your neck, the, you know, depending upon where you break it, you would lose function below that point if the spinal cord is severed. If you wear a cervical collar, it goes around your neck. So cervical refers to neck. You have seven of those vertebrae. Those vertebrae have this particular kind of a generic arrangement. There is a transverse foramen that you don't see in the other vertebrae. And this is where uh, a, the vertebral artery feeds your, um, feeds your brain. It goes through that. If you were to twist these vertebrae too, long, too much, you might actually sever that artery and have massive internal bleeding and die. Um, vertebral foramen is where your spinal cord goes through. Of course, the spinous process and transverse process are common parts, and the vertebral body are common parts on all the other vertebrae. This is just showing you the uh, side view of that, um, and it's showing you that transverse foramen allows for the vertebral artery to, um, to go up into the brain. actually goes that way, goes, goes superior. So this is just showing you the, uh, the first two vertebrae and how they articulate together. Um, this would actually, the, the, the uh, occipital bone, um, that occipital condyle would actually sit in those little facets right there uh, and articulate with the first two vertebrae. They do rotate each, around each other so you can have a side-to-side -side twisting of your head. So that's kind of a cool part. And the top one is called the atlas. That would be C1 and axis is C2. So remember, atlas holds the world. And uh, Atlas uh, holds your head uh, um, onto your, the rest of your body. So T1 through T12 uh, are your thoracic vertebrae, and they are, you know, they do have the, uh, um, they do have intervertebral foramen, which are holes this way from a side view that allow for nerves to pass through. And again, just generically, spinous process, transverse process, uh, vertebral foramen, vertebral body, these would be the parts that you would be familiar with. And that's just a side view of the vertebral, uh, the, the um, thoracic vertebrae. So we have uh, L1 through L5, these are your lumbar vertebrae. And then we have the sacrum and the coccyx. So here's the sacrum and the coccyx below. And again, just, you know, kind of gets monotonous here, but spinous process, transverse process, vertebral foramen, vertebral body, these are the parts, and transverse process, these would be the parts of the vertebrae you would need to know. And there are your cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae. If given a typical uh, thoracic, lumbar, uh, thoracic, uh, 
cervical, thoracic, or lumbar vertebrae, you should be able to tell the difference between them. The lumbar are really fat and really strong. Thoracic are kind of intermediate. But then your cervical vertebrae have that transverse, uh, transverse foramen. So they are distinctly different from one another, as you can, as you can clearly see. So your sacrum are, is five fused vertebrae. Uh, in this particular picture, it's hard to show you the five fused vertebrae, but here's here in this particular one, I can see one, two, three, four, five. So those are your five fused vertebrae, and you can almost see the divisions between them with these little lines right here. This is a, a posterior view, a back view of your sacrum. There are a couple things you would want to be familiar with. Um, the sacral canal um, allows uh, you know, uh, nerves to go through. Um, the sacral foramina allow nerves to come through. So there are many different nerves that go through there. The very end of the sacrum is the sacral hiatus. Uh, that can be a place where medications can be uh, injected into. Uh, in younger people. Uh, we won't talk too much about that. Uh, so I'm just trying to look here. Uh, medium sacral crest would be another part that would be something you should be familiar with. So in this view, those would be the parts that I would be familiar with. Uh, you also have the tailbone down here, um, which is the coccyx. Of course, in animals like cats, they have longer tails because they have extra uh, coccygeal bones coming out. So this is showing you a side view or a lateral view, uh, uh, showing you the curvature of that and the coccyx and how it connects in. So nothing major here that you need to know, but medial sacral crest would be, uh, median sacral crest would be one that you would need to know. So this is a frontal view of the, of the sacrum, and sacral foramina would be ones I would know just because there's, there's uh, 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 nerves that come through there. But uh, nothing else is uh, major that you need to know there. And just a coccyx, of course, is a complete bone you need to know. So this is showing you a view of the thoracic cage. Uh, we'll just go ahead and do sac uh, the sternum first. Sternum is made up of the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. And uh, all of those are one bone. They're different, different parts of one bone. And uh, the xiphoid process is just medically important because if you hit the steering wheel going really fast and you don't have your seatbelt on, that becomes a knife and cuts into your liver that's right behind. Uh, when you do CPR, of course, you push on the body of the, of the sternum. And uh, if you notice, there are, is cartilage here that connects the ribs, the actual rib bones, to the, uh, to the sternum. So that right there is nothing but cartilage. So uh, when you do CPR, oftentimes if you push hard enough, you'll hear a cracking sound, and that's the cartilage probably disconnecting to, um, to, the, um, to the ribs. So um, if you don't wear your seatbelt, you, uh, your ribs, you know, you can see they, they, they look like they could disarticulate very easily and become little knives that can puncture into your lungs right behind. So I encourage you definitely to wear your seatbelt. Uh, in terms of ribs, you have true ribs. These are ribs that directly connect into, um, into the sternum, okay? So we, so we have seven true ribs. Um, so the next set of ribs are your false ribs. Uh, they're also known as vertebrochondral ribs. And if you notice on your false ribs, they each connect jointly in, so you have four of those, or four uh, pairs of those. They each jointly connect in into one connection into the sternum. And then your floating ribs, so not really floating around, they just don't connect into the sternum, are back here, and you have a pair of those floating ribs. Okay, together, collectively, uh, this makes a darn good, a darn good uh, protector of your heart, lungs, and some of your uh, organs, such as your liver, would be sitting right in here. So they, they do a pretty good job of protecting. And then from the back below, from the back view too, they do a pretty good job of, uh, of connecting in. This is showing you a, a, a real person's rib cage. Again, showing you that reddish coloration is the cartilage that connects the ribs to the sternum. Okay, so nothing much there that you can see that's different. This is just a back view of the ribs. Again, look at the protection. Of course, you know, things can slide through in between the ribs, but that's a pretty good protective uh, covering around, um, around your body. 
Now, males and females have the same number of ribs, contrary to, uh, to what you might have read in uh, perhaps uh, Genesis um, when you went to Sunday school. Uh, females don't have more ribs than males. Uh, there may be a female or a male that might have more or less ribs, but that would be a, a, just a mutation. This is showing you what a rib looks like. I don't really need you to know any parts of the rib, so we'll just know generically rib. But they do. there is a connecting part that connects into the sternum, and then there's articular facets that connect it into the vertebrae. A couple of disorders of the, of the, uh, of the spinal cord. You can have scoliosis, which is a later, lateral curvature of the back, so a lateral curvature of the back. You can have kyptosis, which is a... Uh, a bent forward uh, view of the back, and lordosis, which is uh, an increased lumbar curve bent uh, backwards. So let me take, sh show you what those look like. So scoliosis looks like this. So from it's a lateral view, and uh, there are many people with scoliosis. This is a common uh, a common issue with the vertebrae through exercise, bracing. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and perhaps even surgery, um, that uh, can hopefully be corrected. Um, so kyptosis is where you have uh, a back that looks like that, and then lordosis is where you have a back that comes in. So here you have more of a, not necessarily a humpback necessarily, but I guess it kind of looks like that. And then you have a, a, a unusual curvature forward and a lordosis. And uh, one thing is sometimes your vertebrae, um, so, and some folks, the vertebrae don't seal, so you have spinal fluids and spinal material and spinal nerves that will bulge out of the, of the back, and uh, that's called spina bifida, and uh, that can be uh, uh, severe, really quite severe and debilitating to not very severe and debilitating, depending upon how much of the vertebrae were uh, closed off. So, I don't know, kind of a, a little bit of a boring vi uh, lecture, but I, I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to hear the, um, to hear the names of the bones and, and to get a sense of, um, of uh, what uh, you're responsible for. You're responsible for all the bones. You're responsible for uh, learning the parts of the bones, especially the ones I circled. And uh, really, you'll have to, in lab time, dig in. We will have, um, you know, somewhere around uh, a couple weeks to three weeks to work on learning all those uh, bones. Um, that's quite a challenge. It's one of the, you know, the bulkier parts of anatomy physiology. So, uh, so in um, in the next lecture, I plan on talking about the uh, the uh, appendicular skeleton. So until then, I will uh, wish you a good day, good morning, good night, whenever you're looking at this video. So I'll see you next time.